Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have five important papers in organic synthesis for the month of July 2023. The first paper for today is the synthesis of methylene cyclobutanes. Some highlights of this paper include copper catalyzed borelative cyclization of aliphatic alkynes. In addition, the authors report a new synthetic strategy for creating highly strained cyclobutane derivatives. The mechanism of this reaction is as follows. Initially, copper will react with B2PIN2 to form a copper boronate species. The alkyne will then undergo borelative cupration, affording the beta selective product as their major product. This can then displace the tosylate, affording product 2A, as well as some byproducts. When the authors tried quenching this with methanol, rather than just getting the cyclized product only, they also observed some of the proto decuperated product. Since intermediate A was able to form in small amounts, they also observed the formation of protonation in the terminal position and borelation in the alpha position. This was impacted to a large extent, depending on the ligand that they used. These are all NHC type ligands, which were coordinating to the copper. The scope of this chemistry is quite good. You can see an aliphatic chloride was tolerated, a protected amine was tolerated, and they were even able to make spirocyclic species such as the cyclopentene, as well as this bicyclobutane derivative 2AD. They also showed some examples where, for instance, this NBOC indole was tolerated, Protecting the nitrogen is required because oftentimes with copper mediated chemistry, you can have the nitrogen reacting as a nucleophile. And when they used a secondary tosylate in the case of 2AC, the chemistry still worked fine. But instead of using a tosylate, they used a mesylate. This chemistry has wide utility. You might not be sure about what you could do with a methylene cyclobutane when the boronate's still on there. Well, it turns out you can do a whole bunch of stuff. You can replace the boron with an iodine, a bromine, a chlorine. You can oxidize it with sodium perborate. You can even install an azide that you can do click chemistry with. In addition to all of the other products that the authors could form, one that I really like is this epoxide 17. The authors make this epoxide using the strategy that they employ in their paper, but I wonder if today's sponsor Reaxis has any alternative ideas about how we can make this compound. One neat trick that I wanted to share is the ability to copy a structure from ChemDraw as a smile string. You can then paste this into Reaxis and get your structure right in the structure search tool. This is really convenient. Let's see if Reaxis is able to conveniently propose a route to the chemical that we want to make. Reaxis has a retrosynthesis planning tool where you can search the structure of interest and it will tell you if any published routes to that compound exist. And it can even predict new synthetic routes which are inspired by similar reactions in the literature. When we search for this molecule, we can see that Reaxis proposed three synthetic routes, all of which involve olefination. I personally would deviate from this and try a Cory Tchaikovsky reaction since we could generate the product in a single step. Although a horner wadsworth emmons reaction or a Wittig reaction, as are proposed here, would also furnish us with an alkene which could be further oxidized to afford the desired epoxide. Here you can see similar reactions in the literature, which are analogous to the intermediate in this synthetic proposal. Reaxis also gives a score to predict how viable the proposed route is. You can use this tool to inspire ideas for potential synthetic disconnections, which may be challenging to conceive of on your own. Reaxis also allows you to customize your search by selecting specific parameters. You can choose to only include building blocks from commercial libraries or potential building blocks which are commercially available with predefined costs. You can also decide how many different synthetic routes you want to explore and even extend the prediction time in case you have a particularly intense molecule. The routes that Reaxis proposes may inspire synthetic chemists to propose new synthetic pathways to target compounds. This provides creative ideas to help researchers solve chemistry problems faster. I want to thank Reaxis for their support of this channel. The second paper for today is the de novo synthesis of Baraprost. Some highlights of this paper include the use of an inverse Diels-Alder reaction for the synthesis of dihydrobenzofuranes and indolines. I'm not going to talk about these too much in this video, but you can check out the paper if you want to know more about the indolines. We're only going to be discussing the total synthesis of Baraprost. Overall, the authors reported a 14-step longest linear sequence synthesis of Baraprost. And they do it using this unique thiophene dioxide, which I thought was pretty cool. Through the elimination of sulfur dioxide, they're able to do a Diels-Alder reaction. Then, after they get this 1,2-dihydroarene, they need to convert it to the corresponding arene. It's worth noting that Bearprost is a pharmaceutical drug used in several Asian countries, including Japan and South Korea, as a vasodilator and an antiplatelet agent. It's an analog of prostacyclin, and the main benefit is it has better stability in the blood. Now let's talk about the retrosynthesis. So you can imagine this is their final product. Because their deals alder requires the installation of a double bond still, they have to do this through some aromatization reaction. They do this through the use of a halogen, and this helps with the stability of the thiophene dioxide, because when the presence of an electron withdrawing group is absent, these things tend to polymerize. The authors also utilize this dihydrofuran, which is derived from the corylactone over several steps. Let's talk about the forward direction. 
So this is the Cori Lactone. Initially, they do a conjugate addition with this cuprate. This adds to the beta position as this is a Michael acceptor. And the resulting enolate is trapped out by TMS. So they make a TMS enol ether. The TMS enol ether is then able to get cleaved via ozonolysis and their reductive workup affords not the ketone, but the corresponding alcohol, which they then protect with TBS chloride. This is all done in one pot, three steps, 41% yield. This is pretty good chemistry. Their next step is to reduce this lactone to the corresponding lactol. They do this using diball and then make it into the mesolate and eliminate it using triethylamine and DMAP. This affords them with their dihydrofuran, which then engages in their Diels-Alder reaction with this thiophene dioxide. Once the inverse demand Diels-Alder occurs, you can see that this is an electron deficient diene as opposed to the typical electron rich diene, and we have an electron rich dienophile as opposed to the typical electron deficient dienophile. They're afforded with this dihydroarene. The dihydroarene is then treated with tert butylithium, and this results in the elimination of the chloride through an unexpected mechanism. We'll talk about that mechanism on the next slide. TBAF then deprotects the two TBS groups, affording them with baroprost. Normally, baroprost is used as the sodium salt. The proposed mechanism of this reaction is as follows. To study the mechanism of this reaction, the authors did deuterium labeling studies. Here we have a deuterium label, and upon treatment with terbutylithium, we can see the deuterium gets incorporated to the position where the chloride previously was. However, if they installed the deuterium in the other position, instead of having the deuterium transfer to the position of the chloride, only the regular hydrogen 1 gets transposed to that position. This led the authors to propose the following mechanism. Initially, when terbutylithium is added to the reaction, this coordinates to the furan. This allows deprotonation of the alpha blue hydrogen, which then produces a carbanion alpha to the tetrahydrofuran. We can then draw a resonance structure where the negative charge is adjacent to the chloride, and through elimination of the chloride, we can generate a carbene. This carbene is able to attack the alpha hydrogen, affording us with product 30. This is quite an unexpected reaction, and if you've ever seen similar reactions like this before, I'd love to hear more about them down in the comments. So I thought that this was a pretty cool paper. I'll be curious to see if Baroprost gets used outside of Asia in the future. The third paper for today is the synthesis of a key intermediate for TBI-223. Some highlights of this paper include the development of a new synthetic route to a key intermediate for TBI-223. The authors also have an excellent example of the importance of both reaction optimization and workup optimization. In addition, this process was demonstrated to be scalable up to 100 grams. TBI-223 is a promising candidate for the treatment of tuberculosis. Currently, linezolid is used for the treatment of tuberculosis, as it's an FDA-approved drug. Unfortunately, linezolid also exhibits toxicity towards blood and bone cells, which limits the overall treatment duration. TBI-223 has been in development for a while, with early indications showing similar positive therapeutic impact without the unwanted toxicity that linezolid has. Continued clinical trials and eventual market uptake and global affordability of this important drug candidate will be contingent on a low-cost scalable route to the API. So if this is going to replace linezolid, the authors are going to need to come up with a better way to make TBI-223. The existing route to TBI-223 involves the use of tribromo neopental alcohol, which is used on a large scale commercially as a flame retardant. It's known that when this is treated with tosylamide, the corresponding n tosyl azetidine can be formed, where the oxetane also forms. This can be deprotected with magnesium and methanol, but unfortunately the product is isolated as an unstable oxalate salt. There have been alternative methods that have been used in the past, such as the use of benzylamine, which could be deprotected with hydrogen and palladium on carbon. But since the apparatus for large-scale hydrogenations is not widely available, the authors sought out a route that would avoid the need to do any sort of deprotection. So instead, what the authors proposed was to first form the oxetane, isolate compound 3 or prepare it in situ if possible, and then treat it with the aniline 2. The aniline 2 could displace both of the bromides, affording them with compound 1, which is a key intermediate to TBI-223. The authors explored some conditions for this, and they found that several sets of conditions were amenable for this reaction. Initially, they found that acetone and cesium carbonate work to their delight. However, cesium carbonate is too expensive to be used commercially on a large scale. When they tried using potassium carbonate instead, they tried adding a potassium iodide co-catalyst with no success. However, when they used tetrabutylammonium iodide catalytically, they saw that this reaction worked quite well. When sodium hydride was used instead, they were still able to get some conversion at room temperature in THF and DMF, but the combination of DMF and sodium hydride is well known to be a safety hazard and should be avoided. Even though this is under mild conditions, it's still something that the authors wanted to avoid it for safety reasons. However, sodium hydroxide could be used instead, and this enabled the authors to get great conversion. Eventually, they decided to work with DMSO and finally sulfalane, as it's abundantly available and is a low-cost solvent which has better stability than DMSO. 
The final entry here shows that sodium hydroxide as a 50-50 mixture in water could be used without affecting the yield to any significant extent. In addition to this, the author still underwent further optimization. One of the problems that the authors were running into is the formation of this impurity 6, where you can see two of the anilines have displaced each of the bromides. This is likely through the formation of this initial intermediate, which still has a pendant bromide. The way that the authors got around this was by exploring the order of addition. They found that when they did a dropwise addition of both solutions in sulfalane to the hot reaction mixture, that they were able to minimize the formation of impurity 6, so that only 2% peak area was observed by HPLC. There's a lot more details about this in the paper, and I'd encourage you to check out the whole thing. But what I did want to mention was that the authors were able to scale this up to a 100 gram scale, getting a purity of 99% with an 88% yield. It'll be interesting to see if this compound gets through clinical trials and eventually becomes an approved drug. I thought this was a really cool paper, and if you haven't read OPRD before, I'd encourage you to check it out, because there's a lot of really good technical information in those that you'd miss out on in a lot of other journals. The fourth paper for today is the total synthesis of metragenine pseudoendoxyl. In this paper, the authors demonstrate a lot of creative uses of chemistry, as you're going to see in a minute, as well as the 11-step longest linear sequence synthesis of metragenine pseudoendoxyl from Carvone. The authors also discovered that metragenine pseudoendoxyl isomerizes via a retromatic reaction, which was a problem initially giving them low yields, but studying this further they began to understand that this could contribute to the unique activity. This is a type of opioid derivative. If you're not familiar with metragenine, metragenine is an opioid found in Kratom, and the authors were trying to synthesize one of the less commonly known alkaloids from the plant. There's a lot of really cool chemistry in this paper, and I want to talk about several of the steps here. I'd encourage you to check out the whole paper in case you miss any of the details. The authors first do an allylic chlorination, followed by a substitution by a methyl cuprate. This affords them with homocarbone 8. Once homocarbone 8 is formed, they treat it with hydrogen peroxide and sodium hydroxide to form an epoxide on the alpha-beta unsaturated ketone. This acts as a Michael acceptor, and epoxide formation is selective due to the mechanism of 1,4 addition. Following the formation of the epoxide, TCCA is used to do another allylic chlorination while simultaneously migrating the alkene to form a tri-substituted alkene. This epoxide is treated with sulfuric acid, followed by sodium pyridate to afford the corresponding carboxylic acid aldehyde 10. We're going to talk about the mechanism of this on the next slide. You might be a little bit confused where did the carbons go. It's a pretty cool mechanism. The authors then form methyl ester 6 via treatment with diazomethane. This is a very convenient way to make a methyl ester, but diazomethane is a bit dangerous, so you got to be careful. Followed by treatment with ammonia to form an imine which can displace the allylic chloride, forming this tetrahydropyridine 15. For the synthesis of 5, the authors use compound 11 and undergo an ortholithiation between the two groups and react that with Weinreb amide 13 to afford them with ketone 12. On a 40 gram scale, that's huge. If you haven't seen this trick before, you're able to do an alpha bromination with copper 2 bromide, and the authors do that to install their bromine that you see in compound 14. The authors then deprotect their PIV group using sulfuric acid, and that affords them with compound 14. Upon treatment with potassium HMDS, the authors were able to prepare compound 5, which then undergoes a 2 plus 3 cycloaddition with the imine 15 to afford them with the natural product core 16. So at this stage, they're almost at their natural product, they're just a few steps away. I would encourage you to check out the full paper if you're interested in how they do this. The rest of this chemistry is relatively straightforward. So, that interesting pyridate cleavage. Initially, once this is treated with sulfuric acid, they get a mixture of diols which they label S3. They didn't need to isolate and characterize these because the pyridate cleavage will clean things up a bit. So this diol can get cleaved by sodium pyridate, and this will make S4. However, not only is this an aldehyde, it's also a 1,2-diketone, and 1,2-diketones are known to react with sodium pyridate as well. The mechanism of this is pretty straightforward. The pyridate is able to coordinate to the two carbonyls, forming a hydrated ketone-like species, which can then cleave the carbon-carbon single bond. You can just kind of imagine these like a 1,2-diol, the same way that we have here, and this is like Lemieux-Johnson oxidation. So this just cleaves the carbon-carbon single bond, generates two equivalents of carboxylic acids, which is how we get carboxylic acid 10, as well as acetic acid as our byproduct. I thought that this was really cool, and if you want to check out the paper that discusses the cleavage of 1,2-diketones, I'll include that in the video description. Now, I mentioned that the compound that the authors make undergoes a retromatic reaction. So the authors looked into this, they were able to isolate compound 3, 18, and 19, and then subjected the compounds to biomimetic conditions where the type of racemization that the authors were observing in vivo could be mimicked under chemical conditions. Here you can see initially compounds 3, 18, and 19 were all essentially one pure compound, and when they were exposed to biomimetic conditions, all of them converge on the same mixture of isomers. So I thought that this was really interesting. You wouldn't really expect something to undergo a retromatic reaction like this, or at least I wouldn't. 
This is a pretty cool paper, and there's even more details in the full manuscript, and I'd encourage you to check it out if you're interested. The fifth and final paper for today is the calcium fluoride mediated synthesis of organofluorides. Some highlights of this paper include the mechanochemical preparation of fluoromix via the use of calcium fluoride and dipotassium phosphate. The authors use fluoromix to synthesize organofluorides from sulfonyl chlorides, activated alkyl bromides, as well as activated heteroaryl chlorides. So initially, fluorospar grade calcium fluoride, which is just 97% pure calcium fluoride, is mechanochemically mixed with dipotassium phosphate. The authors mentioned that you could also use potassium phosphate, and there's a number of different conditions that you could use. Normally, hydrogen fluoride would be produced via the treatment of calcium fluoride with sulfuric acid, but hydrogen fluoride has all sorts of safety concerns. You've probably heard of them before yourself. So the idea here is that if this fluoromix could be used to do nucleophilic fluorination, this might mitigate the use of HF in several different reactions, which could be advantageous, especially if you don't like working with HF. In addition, the authors found that they were able to store this and still use it for up to nine months after it was prepared without having any significant impact on yield. One of the reactions that the authors reported was the conversion of sulfonyl chlorides into sulfonyl fluorides. Some sulfonyl fluorides have a lot of utility, such as these deoxyfluorinating agents. This can be a way to convert alcohols to the corresponding fluoride. And this was the most functional group compatible methodology that the authors reported. In the case where they were preparing alkyl fluorides, they needed to use fairly activated alkyl bromides, such as alpha to a carbonyl, as we see in 38 and 40, or primary fluorides, as is the case in 41. As you might expect, benzylic fluorides were able to be prepared, and there's a number of other examples in their full manuscript that I'd encourage you to check out. The authors also demonstrated CSP2 fluorination of activated heteroaryl chlorides, as you can see here. In this case, three equivalents of fluoromix were used, rather than two as was the case in the alkyl bromides, or one in the case of the sulfonyl chlorides. I just wanted to mention that in case you might have missed it. So overall, I thought that this chemistry was quite good. I'd like to see this chemistry applied to more complex substrates and harder fluorides that are typically challenging to prepare. But nonetheless, avoiding the use of HF is something I certainly desire, and I'm sure any of you that have worked with HF would also desire to displace HF in your own research. Maybe this could be used for deprotections. Hmm, interesting idea. So we have a few honorable mentions for this month. We have the conversion of styrenes to alpha-substituted conjugated enals, as well as the total synthesis of KB343, iron-catalyzed CN cross-coupling, and finally, PCSK9 inhibitor synthesis. And there was a lot of amide couplings in this paper. If you like amide couplings, this is the paper for you. I hope you've enjoyed this selection of papers for this month. If you want to support the channel, the best thing that you can do is share this series with other colleagues. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.